Welcome to this training. My name is Mark Wickersham and I'm going to share with you one of the most common questions I get, which is, so Mark, how do I give a fixed price for bookkeeping work when I have no idea how long the work's going to take? So in this video, we're going to look at how do we overcome that? How can we give our clients a price upfront with confidence knowing that we'll make a profit? And what we're, going to, what we're going to do together is I'm going to walk you through some research. I'm going to share with you a process that you can go through for coming up with a formula. And then I've got something very special for you. But first, just a little bit about me in case you have no idea who I am. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant. I've been in the profession for uh, over 30 years now. I entered the profession in 1988. I trained as a chartered accountant in the UK, qualified after three years at a large multi-partner firm, spent three years specialising in, then in tax and corporation tax, and then a little while later decided that I wanted to have a go at starting my own accounting firm. It was, it was May 1996, an exciting time. I had no clients, but I decided to give it a go. So I, I bought a computer, a desk, and in a spare room in the house, started my accounting firm. It was an exciting day uh, because I was full of hope, enthusiasm for what the future would bring. And the reason I started my own accounting firm was because, partly because I wanted to grow something and make more money, but even more important, uh, I wanted to be able to, uh, to choose the number of hours that I worked uh, within my business. I wanted to choose how many holders I had. Now, as it happened, things started off uh, and went very fast. I started getting clients. Uh, within two months, I decided I had to move into some offices and hire some people. I outgrew those inside 15 months, moved into bigger premises, hired more people. And if you were looking at my practice back in the late 1990s, you might have thought, wow, Mark's growing an impressive firm. And it certainly looked that way. Within two and a half years, by the end of 1998, I had over £200,000 in fees that I'd built up. That's a quarter of a million dollars in, in, in dollar terms. I had, over, I had 200 clients. Uh, I had what looked like a, a fast-growing practice. However, the reality uh, was very, very different. You see, two and a half years in, my life was in a complete mess. I'd made so many crazy mistakes in my business. I found I was working harder than ever before. I, I found that I was the first to arrive at the office every morning because, after all, I had the key. I had to unlock the door to let everybody in. I didn't work lunch hours, went straight through, and then I was the last to leave. Again, I had the key. I had to lock up. But even worse, for two and a half years of my life, I went into that practice every single Saturday morning to catch up with the paperwork, the invoice, the billings, the, uh, the admin work. And I know I'm not alone. I know there are many other accountants and bookkeepers who feel the same way. But even worse, I was working crazy hours. But in those first two and a half years, I didn't make profit. I had constant cash flow problems and I only just made enough to make a living, to get by, to pay the mortgage and to eat. It was a crazy two and a half years. It wasn't great. And what I learned, what I learned was that the single biggest mistake, and I made many, many mistakes, but the single biggest mistake I made when I started my accounting firm is I had no idea how to price. I believed that I had to price by keeping timesheets adding up the hours and billing the client because that's the way I was brought up in the profession in the 1990s. I thought you had to keep timesheets. I didn't know any different. I was also crazy cheap, which is partly why I grew so fast. I was crazy cheap, but I know I'm not alone. I know from various benchmarking studies that uh, there are many other accountants and bookkeepers working crazy long hours and not making enough money. Anyway, fortunately, things changed for me at the end of 98, 99. I met some incredible people, including uh, Ron Baker, who is now a friend of mine, one of my heroes. He was the person who first introduced me in 1999 to this concept of value pricing. I'd never heard of it until then. And when I read his first book, this light bulb went on in my mind and I figured out a better way. I started putting systems in place in my accounting firm in 99 
And the very first system I put in place, which was for some, some tax planning that I used to do a lot of, I was able to increase my price overnight by over three times. Then in uh, late 2000, 2001, I started repricing my existing clients for the compliance work. And I found I was able to increase, on average across my firm, my prices by 20%. And almost no clients left. I did that two years running. So over two years, I put my price up by 44% with very few clients going. My results were so fast that I was able to then sell my accounting firm in a management buyout. My two client managers, Steve and Jonathan, bought the practice. It still runs this very, very day. I was also very fortunate that thanks to the initial success I was having in 1999, I was asked in the year 2000 to speak and share my experience with a room full of accountants in the UK. And something I said must have resonated because the host, my friend Steve Pipe, asked me to speak at every one of his events ever since. We then went into business in 2003 together and uh, I've been teaching the accounting profession now and increasingly around the world how to move to value pricing, to move away from hourly rates to move to value pricing. That's all I teach now. I'm the author of several books and I also mentor accountants through the Value Pricing Academy. I work with people online every single month. So that's a bit about me. So in this video, we're gonna look at how do we give that fixed price up front so we can price with confidence. And I'm gonna share with you quite a bit of detail on the screen, but before we do that, one of the things that uh, I do wanna cover uh, with you is why why must we give a fixed price? Why is that so important? And there's actually many, many reasons why you must do that. And probably the most important of the lot. There was a research study done uh, way back now in 2005 by one of the major software companies. And they surveyed tens of thousands of business owners. And they wanted to find out about how the, well they thought of their accountant. And one of the interesting questions they asked was, what is the thing that you hate the most about your accountant. Do you know what number one was? Number one was surprise bills, not knowing what the price will be until the work's finished, until the timesheets have been added up, the hours added up and multiplied by an hourly rate. That was the number one reason that people hate, what well, the thing they hate the most about the accountant. And it makes perfect sense because we're all the same as customers when we buy anything, we want certainty. We wanna know exactly what we're getting and exactly what the price is going to be. And yet in our profession for years, this hourly billing gives these surprise bills. Some people call it ambush billing because the client doesn't know the price up front and they hate that. Because when you think about it, a client comes in, they want bookkeeping work doing, potential client, and they ask you what's the price? And you might say, well, it's $50 an hour. The next question is going to be, okay, well, how long will it take? And our answer is usually something like this. It's, well, we don't know because we haven't done the work yet. But, but don't worry, trust us because what we do is we keep accurate time records. We'll record all the time we spend. And when we finish the work, we'll send you a detailed itemized bill that tells you what we've done and the price. They hate it. It's a surprise. It's always a surprise when they don't know up front. It's usually more than they expect, which is why we then have real problems sometimes arguing over the price, uh, arguing over the fees after we've done the work, sometimes struggling to collect the cash. So that if for no other reason what th than that, we should stop doing it because customers hate it. If your clients hate it, why inflict that on them? We must give a price up front. Now also a second reason, Another reason for doing it is because research shows, and I'm going to show some research in a short while, research shows that firms that have moved away from hourly billing to fixed pricing or even value pricing make more money. So it's, from your point of view, uh, it's a more commercially sensible way of pricing. Now, those two reasons should certainly be enough, but there are many, many more. Let me give you a few more. One of the big problems is that hourly rate. Have you ever had a situation where somebody said to you, how much will it cost for doing the bookkeeping? And you might have said something like $75 an hour, 50 pounds an hour, wherever you are in the country, in the world. You might have given a, an hourly rate. Have you ever had that reaction where they say, that's really expensive, that's more than I was expecting? 
And if you have, which I'm sure you have, most of us have when we've quoted hourly rates, there's a reason for it. In fact, there's a few reasons for it. One of which is there's, there's no inherent value in an hourly rate because nobody is interested in buying an hour of your time. If you've got a meeting with a client tomorrow, let's say at nine o'clock, I can guarantee that client will not wake up in the morning going, yes, today I get to spend an hour with my accountant, with my bookkeeper. They do not get excited by that. They are not interested in spending hours with you. They don't see value in an hour of your time. The value is in the results they get. It's in your knowledge, the solutions, the results, the outcome. That's what people value. And they don't see that value in an hourly rate. Now, actually, it goes much deeper than that because there's a branch of uh, science, of, of, of psychology called psychophysics. It's been around for over 100 years now where in psychophysics they study how we as humans react to certain things. And one of the things they found is that when it comes to things like weights, temperatures, uh, colours, we are clueless about absolutes, but very good with relatives. For example, if I had two boxers in front of me and I asked you to, to come and pick up those boxers and tell me the exact weight, you probably wouldn't do a very good job. None of us would. We don't know the exact things. But if you had those two boxers and I said, which of those is the heavier, you'd probably get a, have a good guess at that. And what they found in psychophysics is it's just the same with price. We are clueless about price. What we do, whenever we see a price, we, in our, in our minds, at the subconscious level, we don't know it's happening, but what happens is when we see a price, our minds go away to look at something to compare to. We compare with something else to get a feeling for whether it's a, a good price, an okay price, a bad price. That's what we do. And that's what your clients do. And so what happens is when you give an hourly rate, let's say $75 an hour, without realizing it, your client's mind will go away and compare it with something else. It might be, for example, they've just done the payroll and they've just paid their secretary and their secretary is paid at uh, 10 pounds an hour, $15 an hour, whatever it might well be. And whilst that's not a, a fair comparison, in their mind, subconsciously, they're thinking, well, I've just paid someone 15 and you're charging, quoting 75. That feels expensive. And that's a big reason why we get that reaction. It's down to the psychology and a lot of it's very subconscious. So we have to be careful with hourly rates. We should never, ever, ever, ever quote hourly rates. It's crazy. Now, there's many, many other reasons. I'll give you one more. Another problem is a big issue accounting firms have and bookkeepers is cash flow. And... I know that if, if we, when you think about your balance sheet right now, your firm, I'm guessing you may well have on your balance sheet debtors or accounts receivable. You, are, you are, may well be owed money right now by your clients. And that's one of the problems with hourly billing because how, if we don't know what the price is up front, we have to wait till the work's been finished, we add up the hours, we send out the bill, and then we keep our fingers crossed, hoping that the client will pay us sometime within our payment terms, 30 days, whatever it happens to be. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, and that's, that's just a crazy way. We're in the service industry. We should get paid at least on delivery, if not right up front. And there are many firms I work with who get paid in advance now. It completely transforms cash flow and uh, all that money that's currently sat on your balance sheet that's debtors, accounts receivable, money that's owed to you, that could be in your pocket right now if you change the way that you collect money. And of course, to do that, we have to give a fixed price right up front. So we have to move to fixed pricing. I hope that makes sense. Before we dive into some numbers, I just want to get one more thing clear, though. And that is, I started in the profession in the 1980s, started my accounting firm in 96. In 99, I first came across value pricing. And one of the things I found back then is almost nobody, just like me, most of the profession hadn't heard of value pricing. Uh, it was relatively new. In the last decade, I've seen a huge sea change, a big shift. Now everybody's talking about value pricing. And that's because it's so powerful. And the thing that I've seen, particularly over the last 10 years, is a big shift in, in firms moving away from hourly rates towards fixed pricing, giving a fixed price up front. Sometimes it's called flat fees. However, there is a big myth in this profession, 
And this is the myth. Many people think and believe that fixed pricing is value pricing, and it's not. They're two different things. Fixed pricing and value pricing are different things. And I'm going to explain later on the difference, just so you know. But in this webinar, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by looking at fixed pricing, because that's still really important. If we're moving to value pricing as a journey, I found over the years of teaching this, and I've been teaching it for a couple of decades now, what I've found is that people struggle with moving to value pricing, particularly for compliance work. It's a little bit easier, at least conceptually, to understand value pricing when we could put a number on value. For, for example, tax planning. But when we talk about compliance work, like bookkeeping work, like doing tax returns, how do you put a value on you doing someone's books, on you doing the tax return? How do you put a value on that? How do you come up with a number, a price based on value? And that, that's something people find challenging. And I've heard many stories of people who have tried value pricing or even fixed pricing. It's gone wrong. Uh, and so they've gone back to the hourly rates. People have given a fixed price up front for perhaps bookkeeping work or they've given a fixed price for cleanup work and then found the work took way longer and they've gone back to hourly rates. So I'm going to teach you a process for how do we give a fixed price right up front with confidence but I want you to just understand that fixed pricing is not the same as value pricing. We'll go more into that uh, later and I'll explain why but nevertheless fixed pricing is a great place to start. What I want to do next though is before I share with you a framework, a structure and, I'm, and this structure, once you understand this structure, at the end of this training, you'll have a process that you can create a formula, a formula for coming up with a fixed price. But first, what I want to do is share with you some research. I carried out the, I believe it's the largest ever research study in the world on exactly how much accounting professionals, that's accountants and bookkeepers, price bookkeeping services. In fact, it was carried out in 2019, uh, 2,683 accounting professionals took part in the survey. And I want to share with you just some of the findings from that survey, some fascinating findings. Uh, but first, just very quickly, who took part in that survey? Well, as you can see uh, on the page here, that, that it, was a, it was a range of the profession. Uh, in the main, it was qualified accountants, uh, closely followed by bookkeepers, uh, and a few unqualified accountants. And then the other category was people like in the US enrolled agents that do tax returns. That was the makeup of the, the survey itself. But let's get into something more interesting. One of the questions I wanted to ask, obviously, was, well, how do you price bookkeeping? How do you arrive at a price? And there's some interesting things I take away from this. We, so we see that about 40% over the most common way of pricing is still hourly billing, pricing based on the hour. However, I kind of take some heart with this uh, because, if, as I said earlier, way back in 99 when I was first exploring value pricing and I started teaching it in 2000, I started sharing what I'd done in my accounting firm and the results I was getting. And in 2000, 2001, 2002, what I found is almost nobody had heard of value pricing. And if I'd have carried out this survey back in 2000 or 2001, I can almost guarantee that this chart would be very different. I would expect 95%, perhaps 99% would have said hourly billing and almost uh, nothing else on this chart. So what we've seen is this huge shift because people are now recognizing that there are better ways of pricing. What, I've see, what you can see here is almost as many people now are giving a fixed price up front, sometimes called flat fees. Now, as I said, that's not value pricing. Let's not get the two confused. And let me explain why, just in case you're not clear. You see, with, a, with fixed pricing, and by the way, value pricing normally means you give a fixed price up front, but with value pricing, value pricing is about coming up with a price based upon the value to the customer. It starts with the customer. It's based on what they value. But the way that most people give a fixed price in our profession, let's take tax returns as an example. It may be that somebody does a tax return and they charge $750. When I ask the question, so where does that number come from? Why $750? The answer is usually something like this. 
Well, Mark, based on my experience of doing tax returns and my knowledge of doing tax returns, I used to do hourly, but now I, I know roughly how long it takes to do a tax return of this size. And based on my knowledge and my experience of how long it takes, I predict it'll take this number of hours and therefore I'm charging $750. So the good news about this is at least we're giving the customer a price up front, which is way better than the hourly billing for the reasons I explained earlier. We're giving a price up front. However, that price is still based upon time. It's a form of cost plus pricing, and, and, and that's very different to value pricing. So fixed, fixed, flat fit, fixed and flat fees, it's not value pricing, but nevertheless, it's, it's, it's an improvement. Or it's, a, it's a better way of pricing. And we are seeing now in the profession, you can see from the survey results, that it's almost as many people are doing that now, which is great. We're seeing this shift. But we're, we're, what we're also finding is that increasingly firms are starting to explore other pricing methodologies. For example, menu pricing. That means, it's my terminology for giving the customer different choices, different packages, different options. Think of it, if you like, as bronze, silver, gold. You've seen it, it's getting more and more common now. I call it menu pricing. And menu pricing is the first step towards value pricing. And I won't go too much into the detail of that. I just want you to be aware that firms that are menu pricing are now starting their value pricing journey. And then I started to look at other ways that people price. I called it a pricing system here. I've summarized the data. But essentially, some people are moving to a complete value pricing process. So let's look at the next question. One of the things I want to do is, I know we've talked about hourly rates are crazy, but nevertheless, something I'm sure you want to know the answer to is what... Uh, what are the average hourly rates? What do people charge for bookkeeping services? Now, just so you know, what we did in the survey is we had firms from all around the world. And what we did with the data is when we analyzed the data, we turned it all into it, uh, conver current conversion rates at the time into US dollars. So all the numbers were in US dollars for comparative purposes. And what we also did is we broke down the data into different countries. So the most significant countries in terms of the data that we collected, the US, Canada, and the UK, we created specific sets of benchmarks around those. So let's take uh, the US uh, as a starting point. I asked what was the uh, hourly rates that people charge for bookkeeping services. And the, what the graph's showing, just so you, uh, you can understand this, is on the, uh, the, the yellow one is the, the smallest hourly rate. We actually, in the data analysis, we ignored the top and the bottom 3%, because sometimes people might have put $5 when they meant 50, they forgot the zero, they didn't type it right. So by removing the top and bottom 3%, we remove any anomalies. So having taken those out, the 3%, the, the yellow number, the 25, is the lowest price. At the other end is the highest price. And then we looked at the quartiles, the 25%. So in other words, $50 means that 25% of firms in the survey charged up to $50. The next 25% between 50 and 75, and so on. And so the first thing we take away from looking at this, and this is the thing that I found staggering, well, I say staggering. For me, it wasn't surprising because I've done many benchmarking studies now in the accounting profession over the last 15 years. And what I've always found, whether it's bookkeeping, how we price tax returns, annual financial statements, whatever it might well be, one thing I find is always the same. And that is when you look at the the lowest prices and the highest prices, there is a huge range of prices. Look at this. The lowest was $25 an hour, the highest $175 an hour. Now, if my math is correct, that's a seven-fold difference, a seven-fold increase, a higher price. And what that tells me very clearly and, and, and demonstrates to you is that there, the pricing is all over the place in our profession. It is all over the place. What it also says is that there's no such thing for accounting services, for bookkeeping, and in fact, for all the things I've ever benchmarked, benchmarked there's no such thing as a market price. You see, sometimes people say to me, I might say to someone, you're, you're pricing too low, you're charging $75 an hour for bookkeeping, it should be much higher, and they might say to me, Mark, you don't understand. You see, in this industry, in this area, the going rate is $75 an hour. That's rubbish. If there was a going rate, if there was a market price, 
When we do these benchmarking studies, we wouldn't see a sevenfold difference. We'd see a much, much narrower range of prices. But the reality is, prices are everywhere. And that reflects the fact that, as a profession, we have no idea how to price. What it also tells us, and this is reassuring, particularly if you're at the bottom end, is that some firms, some accountants, some bookkeepers have found a better way. And so if some people are able to charge $175 an hour, why can't you? They must, be doing, they must be doing something right and we can learn from that. Now, what else can we take away from this? Well, the next thing is the average price, or technically the median price, was, uh, as you can see, is $75 an hour. Which I think, personally, I think that's crazy low, still, because bookkeeping is a valuable service. So that's the average, 75. And then the $95 is where the top 25% kick in. So in other words, the top 25% of firms would charge between $95 an hour and 175. And so if you were to carry on using hourly, and I hope by the end of this session you will stop hourly rates, but if you do, then you can use this as a benchmark. You should be aiming to be somewhere in the top 25%, $95 an hour or higher. Now, the next question I looked at, and this was an interesting one, I wanted to know, to what extent do people review the prices with their clients at least once per year? And as you can see here, it was pretty much 50-50. Half the profession, slightly more than half actually, but half the profession don't change their price every year. And I find that strange because there's something, I don't know if you've heard of this, but there's a concept, there's something called inflation. And that means, inflation means prices, costs go up every single year. And if we have inflation and costs change, then so should your prices. Your prices should be reviewed at least every single year. But there's more to it than that. You see, your client's circumstances change. The scope of the work changes. It's the, the, your client's situation right now is not exactly the same as 12 months ago. The scope of work changes. Their goals, their aspirations, their, their challenges are changing all the time. And so, as a result of that, what they value changes. And not just that, you change. Let me ask you this question. Think back to when you started in your business and think about today and compare the two. Do you know more today about bookkeeping, bookkeeping and accountancy? And can you add more? Are you more valuable today and do you know more today than when you first started out? And I'm hoping the answer is yes. We, as, as we go through our, our journey and gain experience, we can deliver more value, more insights, more knowledge to our clients. In other words, as you go through your, your life journey, you become more valuable. And as you become more valuable to your clients, your price should go up. So bottom line is everything changes. <laughs> everything changes. You should review your prices at least once a year. And, and so, as we can see, half the profession isn't doing that. And if that's you, please change. Please change. And the next thing I want to look at very quickly is I then want to find out how do different countries price and what are the different results. And one of the things we looked at in the survey is, is hourly rates is fine, but actually benchmarking hourly rates is crazy. Trying to compare your hourly rate to somebody else is actually of no use whatsoever because there might be one firm charging $100 an hour, another $75 an hour. And you might conclude the one charging $100 an hour is pricing better. However, they might not bill all their time. They might write off 50% of their time, whereas the firm at $75 an hour bills every single hour that goes on the timesheet, in which case they're actually getting better results. So we can't compare hourly rates. It's a waste of time. So what we did in the survey is we looked at specific scenarios. We, we painted a picture of specific types of client and asked how much would you charge per month for this particular client? And again, we then created the quartiles from the bottom to the top. And I've not put the numbers on this because the numbers are uh, of not as, as much use as the actual, just the comparisons. And what you can see from here, which is really fascinating, is that the US, accountants and bookkeepers in the US, actually get higher prices than the rest of the world, which I found staggering. And also a little bit, for me, a little bit um, depressing. 
because I'm from the UK. I was hoping the UK accountants and the UK bookkeepers would fare fairly well. But actually, interestingly, they were way below average. So I thought that was interesting. So why is it that in the US they are better at pricing? And I looked at things like it could be just because prices are different. Prices are higher in the US. Not really. A little bit. It could be because when we translated all the data into US dollars for comparative purposes, we did it at the exchange rate at a particular date. And as you know, exchange rates go up and down. And in the UK, we, at the time of doing the survey, we were in the middle of all the uncertainty with Brexit, and the pound hasn't been faring too well. However, it doesn't account for the huge difference here. So I wanted to find out, well, why is it? And we went through the data and we analysed it in detail. And one of the things we found which is interesting is I shared with you earlier, how do, how do people in the survey, how do they price? And I showed you the, one of the first charts was the, the, uh, the most common way of, uh, of pricing is hourly rates. It was 40.2% price using hourly rates. Giving a single fixed price or flat fees was getting as close. It was a close second at 34%. Now, that data that I shared earlier in the chart was for the population as a whole. What we did is we then looked at the US. And one of the things that was fascinating is when we looked at the US was that it was very, very different. Over in America, they are much less likely to use hourly rates. In fact, moving to a single fixed price, fixed fees or flat fees, is now the most common way of pricing for bookkeeping services in the US. And when we look at value pricing, again, there's a greater instance. So the one, what I found in, my, in the study was that the single biggest reason for why they are better at pricing in the US is because they are making this transition from hourly to fixed pricing and some a greater transition towards some form of value pricing. Firms that price based on value get better results than those that price based on the hour. Now, in the survey, when we did it, we hired a, a, a number of consultants around the world. to They were, they were book, leading bookkeepers in, in their field with their own followers, helping the bookkeeping community. And we had people uh, over in Diane Lucas over in Australia as a consultant. In the UK, we had Jane Aylwin. Over in uh, uh, Canada, we had Teresa Slack. And in the US, uh, Jan Haugo and also Gabrielle Fontaine. And they helped us make sure the questions made sense and they gave advice within the report itself. And this particular quote within the report from Gabrielle Fontaine, I thought was really interesting. And you can read it, it's on the screen right now. But what she says is, is actually very profound, that as a profession, we are still too fixated on costs. And that's stopping us and holding us back from properly embracing value pricing. In fact, my friend Ron Baker said to me, I was with him a little while ago, a year or so ago, and he said to me, in his opinion, you cannot master value pricing while still keeping the timesheet. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. While ever you keep the timesheet, your focus is on costs, how long the job takes. And value pricing is a completely different way of, of pricing. So we, we need to find some way of getting rid of the timesheet. However, the problem here is within our profession, accountants, bookkeepers, if we understand our personality profiles, very often accountants and bookkeepers are very methodical. We are very detailed. We need systems. We are brilliant at systems. We love our checklists, our audit checklists, our accounts uh, preparation checklists, tax return checklists, our standard forms, our standard letters, our templates. We love formulas and systems. And one of the things that we like about timesheets is it's a formulaic approach to pricing. We put the hours on the timesheet, we multiply by an hourly rate, and we come up magically with a price. It's not a very good system for the reasons I shared earlier, but nevertheless, we like it because it feels like there's a system. Whereas if we move to value pricing... There is no formula for value pricing because the thing that makes value pricing challenging is that value, as my friend Ron Baker says, value is in the hearts and minds of customers. It's a feeling. And everybody values things differently. So if every customer values things differently, how do we come up with a price? And that's a challenge. We can do that, but there's no formula. It's judgment and feelings. And that's why today what we're going to look at is 
let's just look at the first step of the journey, which is moving to fixed pricing. Because we can still come up with a formula for giving a fixed price. And if we can come up with a formula, we can then price upfront with confidence. And once you're getting better results, you may one day decide that the timesheet is no longer needed. But I'll leave that entirely up to you. That's you to decide. Now, just final thing on the survey. Uh, I created a 96-page research report, and we've covered some of the findings uh, today in, in this session. But there are many, many more in the research study. For example, I looked at how do accountants price compared to bookkeepers? Who, who prices better for bookkeeping services? And that was a fascinating insight. I also looked at the top quartile, or top 25%, versus the bottom 25%. To look at patterns, what specifically are those firms getting better prices, doing different? What are, the, what are the things that are getting results? And then the most interesting part of the survey was I then took those scenario clients I mentioned earlier and showed the results, which means you can specifically benchmark prices. Uh, that was part E of the report, so you could look at one of those clients and you can see exactly how much other people would charge for that particular type of client with a certain number of transactions and bank accounts and so on. And then you can compare and benchmark what you would price against the rest of the profession, which is much more useful, as I mentioned, than comparing hourly rates, because there's no sense in comparing and benchmarking hourly rates. And anyway, I'll tell you more later about how you can get hold of that research report. But what I want to do now is make this really practical. I want to share with you exactly how do you do this? How do you come up with a formula for pricing bookkeeping services so you know that you're always going to make a profit before you even start the work? And the key to this is, is all about scope. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the pricing journey and that we have over here, we have our hourly billing, which is a terrible way of pricing as we've discussed. The best way of pricing is value pricing. But what I've found, I've been teaching this now since the year 2000, and what I've found, particularly for compliance services, that when people try to move too fast from hourly billing to value pricing, they find it hard. And it is hard. It takes time. There's, a, there's some complex uh, processes or, or mindsets we have to uh, get around because value is subjective. You can't touch it, you can't feel it. And so we have to think of it as a journey. And whilst fixed pricing is not value pricing, it's nevertheless an important part of the journey because we have to make sure that even if we have a fully value pricing, we want to make sure that our value-based price is going to give us a profit. And so a, start, a good starting point is to come up with a system, a process for fixed pricing. And so we're going to focus on that here because of all of the various steps on the journey from hourly to value pricing, it's that first step, the one that moves to giving a fixed price up front that people find the hardest. That's the hardest first step. Once you, can, once you have a formula for giving a fixed price up front, it actually becomes a lot easier then to add in the extra layers to take the next steps and start to move to value pricing. Now, I'm going to come back to this uh, slide later on because I want to revisit this journey and talk a bit more about value pricing when we finish. But what I want to talk about next is how do we come up with a formula for fixed pricing. And the starting point is we have to understand the scope of work. What are the scope factors? What are the things about this particular client we're talking to that we can ask questions, things that will impact on how much work's involved, how long the job will take, and ultimately our costs. So we have to understand scope. Now in the survey, one of the questions I did ask was, what are the most important scope factors when it comes to bookkeeping services? What are the things that have the single biggest impact on price? And I call the primary scope question the thing that has the biggest impact. And in the case of bookkeeping services, perhaps no surprise really is the thing that people said is number one is the total number of transactions per month. The more transactions, the more data to process and therefore there's more work involved it's a greater scope of work, and therefore the price has to be higher. That was the number one. Now, of course, we can apply the same uh, thinking to every other service that you offer. So if you think about tax returns, it wouldn't be number of transactions. It might be different sources of income. 
And so what I'm going to share with you is a process, a thought process, that once you understand this for bookkeeping, you can then apply it to other accounting services. But we're going to stick with bookkeeping today. So the number of transactions. And so what you want to do is you want to carry out some analysis. This is exactly what I did way back in 1999 when I was in my accounting firm, when I switched from hourly to giving a fixed price and moving to value pricing. I had to, my biggest challenge back in 99 was I could understand this value pricing concept and I was, accountant, I was an accountant doing annual financial statements. And it was, my question was, how do I give a potential, a potential new client, a prospect, a price when I haven't even started doing the work yet? And so I went through a process, and, and this is essentially the process I went through. Now, a word of warning first. I'm going to give you some worked examples here. This is just dump, dummy sample data. Please do not look at the numbers on the screen and say, ah, that's what I have to charge. No, it's just, this is just numbers just to illustrate a concept. So you want to do some analysis. This, this might take you about 30 minutes, perhaps an hour, two hours at most. Once you've done this, you will end up with a formula that you can use for life, for the rest of your professional career, for giving a price for bookkeeping services. So for a, an hour's worth of work, this is going to unlock for you the formula. What you do is you take a random sample of clients. Twelve, a dozen clients is a, is a good starting point. You probably want a, a good six or seven, ten ideally, possibly fifteen, but a dozen is a, is a good number. And what you do is you, you pick those clients at random, and you, for each one, you put in an Excel spreadsheet, for example, or create a table that lists what is the number of transactions per month, which is the primary scope question, and what's the fee that you charge that client? And so I've put those in this table here. And Excel's a great way of doing this because what we can then do is something called regression analysis. Now, over the next five, ten minutes, this might start to get a little bit scientific. So if it starts to lose you, please don't worry. You can always rewind and watch it again. But also, I'm going to give you a solution at the end, which actually takes away all the need for this. But before I talk about the solution, it's really important to understand the thought processes. So what we can do with this, once we've got our, our data from analyzing some of our clients, we can plot that data. And then what we can do is create through regression analysis, something called a line of best fit. Now, something like Excel will do a lot of the work for you and make it very simple. So you can see here I've plotted the data for these 12 clients and created a line of best fit. And interestingly, what we can do with that line is we can turn that into an equation or a formula. And, uh, and I'll talk about that in a short while. But what you might be thinking, and sometimes the object objection is, OK, Mark, a formula will be great and a formula for that line will be awesome, but I can see from that chart straight away that there are some of those clients where if I use that line as my formula, some of those clients are actually their price has to, is much, much higher and above that line, and therefore I need to charge more, and some is below. And you'll be absolutely right. And But the point I want to, a point I want to make is, firstly, we're not looking to have something that's precise. We're never going to get, you're never going to come up with a formula where when you look at your existing clients, all the dots are on that line, okay? You're never going to get that. You're never going to get 100% perfect predictive formula that will predict exactly what the price should be to make sure you get exactly uh, the profit that you want. And that's not important for a number of reasons. Number one, number one, the first reason is the fact that what this formula does is it means that when you do the analysis is over time, over a portfolio of clients, you will make money. Some clients you might make an extra profit on and some you might make a loss on. But what's really important when we're pricing is it's more important to focus on the profit of your firm. We want to make sure your firm is profitable, more important than, fo than focusing on profit per client. But another reason, another reason is Okay, it may be an imperfect formula, but actually, what have we got at the moment? We have hourly billing. The reason why as a profession we love hourly billing is because it feels precise. But let's just spend a couple of minutes just thinking about this. Where do hourly rates come from? Well, we know from the benchmarking study, they're all over the place, from $25 to $175. It's pretty much, nobody has a clue what the hourly rate should be. It's all over the place. 
Now, I know that in the UK, accounting firms, when they come up with uh, hourly rates, t- typically use a multiple of, uh, of salary costs. And from benchmarking studies I've done in the UK, it's usually between three and four times salary cost. The average is about 3.5. Three and a half times the salary cost gives us a hourly rate. And that's what we use. But really, there's no real science to that. Why that number has got no bearing on the value to the customer, it's just a formula we've used uh, and copied, and done. it's based on what we've done in the past and copying other firms. There's no, there's no logical reason for that hourly rate. It's, just, it's essentially a made-up number. And then what we do is we multiply that by the number of hours on the timesheet. And my question for you is, how accurate is that number? And I, and I know it's not. I remember when I was in the profession years ago, before I started my accounting firm in the late 80s, early 90s, timesheets were largely made up. When you, if you're, if you're a, an employee working on a job uh, in the firm I work for, a large multi-partner firm, overtime rates weren't paid. So what would happen is if you were working on a job, if you were in charge of a job and you were running behind on that for whatever reason, you would work late. And those extra hours didn't go onto the timesheet because you want to make your numbers look good to the boss, to the manager, to the partner. So the numbers on the timesheet bore no reflection to the work was actually done. And so we're multiplying a, a random number, an hourly rate that is meaningless, by a fictional number, which is the number of hours on the timesheet. But then what we do is we multiply that by something else. One of the things I've learned from benchmarking studies in the past is that most firms do not bill every single hour that goes on the timesheet. In fact, in the UK, benchmarking studies show that the average recovery rate is 92%. In other words, accounting firms typically, on average, write off 8% of time. And this is what's called commercial judgment. The thinking is often this. You have finished the work, and you print out the work in progress report that shows how much time has been spent. And you look at that and think, oh my goodness, that's 5,000. The client's never going to wear that. I can't bill 5,000. We'll lose the client. We'll have a dispute. So what do I think I can get away with? We'll go with four. And we write time off. And sometimes we might write time on. But essentially, if we're kidding ourselves, if we're thinking that hourly rates and time sheets is accurate, we are kidding ourselves, okay? It's It's an inaccurate way, and it's a lousy way of pricing, as we've discussed. But third and finally, and this is even more important, is yes, I accept that what's on the screen right now is not that accurate. But we've only looked at one scope factor. We've only looked at number of transactions. There are other things that are important as well. So when we do this analysis, we now go a step further. So we've only done a first cut. We've gone and analyzed and looked at and created a line of best fit. What we then need to do, and by the way, what we can do by, with that is Excel will, nice, will give us a formula. And also it'll give us some statistics, the most useful of which is what's called the R squared number, which is a number that falls between zero and one. The closer to one, the better. In this particular case, this is just example data, by the way, uh, but it's 0.824, which basically means that the equation explains 82% of the variation in fees. And so if you've done this analysis and got an R squared number of 0.7 or more, that's actually pretty good statistically. But we can go a step further because, as I said, we've only looked at the primary scope factor. You see, what we need to do is now look at the outliers. We want to look at those clients that are furthest away from the line. So, for example, with this dummy data, client H, it may be that client H, we build them 7,392. But the formula for the line of best fit is suggesting it's 5,935. So why should client H be a higher price? And so what we need to do is look at the other scope factors, the, the secondary scope factors. And again, going back to the research study, I asked the accounting profession, what are the other important factors when coming up with a price for bookkeeping services? And so we need to think about those things, and, and you may come up have, have some of your own. So we, we come up with our secondary scope factors, and now it's time to investigate the outliers, those clients that are furthest away. And so it might be, for example, client H, the reason why it's their, their fee last year was 7392 and the formula won't give us a, a good price is because we know that 
as well as the number of transactions for that client, they have multiple bank accounts. They also might have foreign currency transactions. And so we might want to think, okay, well, if they've got multiple bank accounts, therefore there's more bank reconciliations to do, perhaps we add 10% onto the price for multiple bank accounts. And if the client has foreign currency transactions, then it may be that we add something on for that. And it may be if they're on particular accounting systems or they're in particular industries, and, and you'll decide based on your experience. So again, what we do, and Excel is really useful for this because we can actually start to automate this with some formulae. What Excel can do is it can look at your clients, your 12 clients or what, the number that you've done, and it can start to look at well, which ones are furthest away from the line. Some will be close. Those that are close are fine. But what we do is we look at those that are statistically the furthest away from the line, like client H. And what we then do is we look at those clients and we ask ourselves the question, why does this client have a higher price or lower price? What is it about this client uh, that makes the job either easier or harder? And you just use your experience. You look at those clients. You know your clients. Is it because they're in a certain sector? Is it because they have? Uh, is it because they have multiple bank accounts? Is it because they have, uh, for example, uh, it could be to do with sales tax. It could be to do with uh, the industry that they're in, the accounting system, the accounting system they're using, uh, and many, many other things. So you identify for each client what they might well be, and what we can then do is we can start to based on that, based on identifying those factors, we can then use our judgment to come up with what we might need to adjust the price by. So it may be that one of the clients is actually coming up with a lower price than the formula, but that's because they're a sole trader. And you, maybe you find from experience that sole traders are easy to, to do the bookkeeping for than, say, corporates. Uh, it's, it's judgment, you decide. But let's say, for example, that it may be a lower price if it's a sole trader, a higher price if it's a corporate. It may be that it's a lower price if they're in a certain sector. Uh, and so you can use your judgment to come up with what that extra percentage should be or, or reduced. Now what we can then do with Excel is we can then, having identified those factors, what are, what are those secondary scope factors and what are the percentages that we feel based on judgment that we should adjust the price up or down, what we can then do, and this is where the magic kicks in, what we can do is we can then take the prices that we've charged those clients and we can adjust them uh, upwards or downwards assuming those factors aren't actually in the, in, in coming into play. And, and so we can create a, an overall multiplier. And what that means we can do is we can just rerun the regression analysis. And what you should find is when you rerun the regression analysis is that the R squared number gets that goes up, is that we have a better line of best fit. And if it's not high enough, you can go uh, back a couple of steps, and it may be because you want to just tweak some of the the numbers, the, the percentage uplift or downlift, depending on, on the circumstances. You can go backwards and forwards a few times until you get to a line that gives you a good formula and a good best fit. And once you've got this, you've got a formula. You've got a better system than hourly rates, both better because the customer prefers a fixed price up front, and a system that, despite the fact it's not perfect, there'll always be some times when you give a fixed price and it perhaps should have been a bit more. Sometimes you might actually make a super profit. It may be the other way around. But that's no different to hourly rates. With hourly rates, we write time off. We make up time on timesheets and all sorts of crazy stuff. Now, it may be that you're worrying at this point, though. One of the things people say to me is one of two things. They either say, Mark, this kind of makes some sort of sense, but it's a bit confusing, and I'm not sure that uh, I have the time or want to build the X play around in Excel. And sometimes people say to me, uh, Mark, I love the idea of this, but I've only just started my bookkeeping business or my accounting firm. I don't have those, that history of clients that I can analyze. Okay, not to worry, because what uh, I've done for you is I've done, some, I've done the analysis for you. What I did is I said to you in the benchmarking survey, I, I took some specific scenarios of clients. And what we then did is we looked at for each of those scenarios, based on number of transactions, bank accounts, and so on, we then find out exactly how much people are charging. What's the average price? What's the top 25%? What's the top 10% charging? And we start to analyze that data. We then hired a mathematician, who happened to be an accountant as well, but he's a mathematician and also an Excel genius, and he went and did detailed regression analysis with that data to come up with a formula, a formula based on what the best performing firms are doing for pricing bookkeeping services. 
And we took that formula, having got the formula, and we built it into a piece of software. A piece of software that you can run from your computer, your iPad, your, 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 your phone, and what you can do is you can answer a handful of simple questions about your client circumstances. The scope questions. You answer a few questions. It takes probably 60 seconds to do that. And then at the end of it, you press a button and it will go and calculate a price. It actually calculates three prices depending on where you want to aim at. So you can either aim to be average. If you know your prices are really low right now, just moving to having average prices might be a great result for you. If you think you're already somewhere around the middle, then aiming for the top 25% or the top 10%. So we've called them, we ask, you with, we ask with the software, what's your price in gold? Do you want to be average? Good or great, which corresponds to, corresponds to the average prices, the top 25% and the top 10%. And you would choose based on where you currently are. It's a tool that comes up and gives you a price. And what we've done for you, you'll see on this page, is if you want, you can access this tool. And we've got a very special deal for you where you can access this software for a single one-off payment and you can use it for life. There's no ongoing, there's no ongoing uh, subscription payments to make for this. You just pay a one-off payment and you can use it for life. You can use it to, to price as many clients as you want, no restrictions. And what it does, it will come up with a suggested price. And then once it comes with a suggested price, you can then decide what price you want to charge. And on the dashboard, it'll track how you're doing with your pricing. The purpose of the tool is to help you to bit by bit over time get the confidence to price more for your bookkeeping services. Now, what we've also got for you as part of this special, uh, special offer is not just the software, but you can also get access to the 96-page research report. Normally, you can buy this for $97, but as you'll see, on this screen, we have a crazy deal for you where you can get for a much lower price both the research report and access for life to the software. So you'll find that below. Now, before we finish, I want to share with you uh, one more thing. I said to you that we'll revisit this, uh, this screen about your journey to value pricing. I said to you that it's a journey and that most people, many people struggle with value pricing because it's, it's challenging. It's, it's about uh, understanding how, how do we understand how much people value something. We also need to understand that value pricing is not merely just coming up with a price. Value pricing is, is about knowing what questions to ask the client, asking the right questions so we can unpick, uncover what is the value. It's about then understanding how do we present our solution? What are the words we use, the communications so our clients understand the value? What's the price psychology we can use? How to give people different choices? And, uh, and, and you can see from this slide here, there's a number of steps that we can take. The, hard, the single hardest step is moving to a fixed price. Once you have a formula, a process for giving a fixed price, it's much easier to move to the next steps. So for example, if you use the software, what the software will do is give you a price. That price should be your minimum price because really you, can, really you should be charging more and we can do that using techniques. For example, menu pricing. You might decide to create a bronze, silver, gold, and therefore the price created by the software is your bronze price, but you then offer a silver and a gold at a higher price. Now, interesting what happens with menu pricing is, and when you understand the psychology behind it, is that when faced with three choices, most of us as customers, as consumers, will go for the middle option. And therefore, your clients will choose to pay you more money. And that's another reason why, going back to earlier, you do not need to worry that your line of best fit isn't, one, isn't an R squared of one, which you'll never get. It's never going to be perfect. But as you move on your journey to value pricing, as you add on more layers of and techniques and ideas, what you'll find is that the prices you will get will be much greater than what the software suggests as you learn value pricing. And therefore, you'll always make a profit every time. Sometimes you make an incredible profit. I have firms that I've taught value pricing that they tell me, Mark, I've used your techniques and I can't believe it. I've just got three times the price, four times the price. One bookkeeper uh, told me a few years back, he got seven times the price using some value pricing principles and techniques and ideas. So 
There's a lot more to this journey to move to value pricing. Today, I want to stick with and focus on that first step in the journey. How can we move from hourly billing to giving a fixed price up front with confidence because we have a system, a structure, a formula, a piece of software that means you can give a price with confidence, knowing that most of the time you will make a profit. In fact, on average, over time, you will make a profit. But then once you've got that in place, you can then start to move along the journey and start to learn more things. And if you want to, you can work with me. I can teach you uh, these techniques. Uh, if you want to join the Value Pricing Academy, you can do exactly that. But my recommendation is, that's perhaps for later, start with this first step. Start with fixed pricing. And if you want a tool for doing that, check out the details below. Thank you so much for uh, watching this video. And uh, I look forward to helping you on your journey, helping you to get much better prices with confidence for your bookkeeping services. Bye for now.